In this talk, I'm going to talk about the cross and resurrection in Mark. And there's a sense in which the cross simply hangs over the whole of the gospel. Almost at the very beginning, in chapter 2, verse 6, have a look at that story. You hear some scribes sitting there, and when Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, they say, why does this man speak like this? He is blaspheming. And of course, blasphemy is the sin for which he's going to be put to death in the end. Who can forgive sins, they say, except one, namely God. And there are very often straws in the wind. When Jesus heals a, a, a man with a withered hand in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And by the way, when you see synagogue, Sabbath and scribes, you know there's going to be trouble in Mark's Gospel. And he asks, is it allowed to heal on the Sabbath or not? And he silences the opposition. And then hear the, the reaction. The Pharisees went out and straight away they took counsel with the Herodians, who were a very different body of people, against him, how they were going to destroy him. So you see, right from the beginning of the Gospel, the authorities are plotting to kill Jesus. And you should feel the tension all the way through this Gospel as you read it. But it gets much more serious in the second half of the Gospel. And actually, I would like you to read the whole lot and notice how round about the middle to the end of chapter 8, suddenly it starts to get darker. The miracles disappear, the crowds disappear, and you've just got the disciples who don't understand a word of what Jesus is saying because he's teaching them about what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem. So chapter 8, verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Then the next one is at chapter 9, verse 31. For he was teaching his disciples and saying to them that the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of human beings and they're going to kill him. And when he's been killed, after three days he will rise again. Then the final one is in chapter 10, verses 33 to 34. I hope you're looking at these. Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed, but those who followed were afraid. And again he took the twelve and began to say to them the things that were going to happen to him. Look, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man is going to be handed over to chief priests and scribes, and they're going to condemn him to death, and they're going to betray him to the Gentiles. And they'll mock him, and they'll spit on him, and they'll flog him, and they'll kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. Each of those three sayings that I've just read actually carries a prediction of the resurrection, but we don't notice. What really dominates our attention is the crucifixion. And from now on in the Gospel, you can just feel the tension mounting. In chapter 11, the Messiah comes into the temple, and you think, right, he's going to ride in on a white horse and drive those Romans into the sea. But nothing of the sort happens, because at verse 11, at chapter 11, after he's entered Jerusalem on his donkey, you remember, he looks at his watch, and because it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the Twelve. It's a real anticlimax. But then he comes back, and the next day, this pious Galilean is clearly shocked by what he's found in the temple, and he expels the sellers and turns over the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. So that's a serious thing to do. Imagine, I don't recommend you do it, but imagine what would happen if you did this in your church tomorrow. And then the high priests and the scribes and the elders, you see, we've heard these before, haven't we? They come to him and say, by what authority are you doing these things? And of course, we know the answer because we've read the gospel up to now. And the authority is the authority of God. But we know that this means trouble because these are the political and religious authorities. And so he tells them this, he asks them the question about John the Baptist. By what authority did John the Baptist do what he did? Was it from, from God, or was it from somewhere else? 
So he's really trapped them, and they refuse to give an answer. And he said, OK, in that case, neither am I going to tell you by what authority I'm doing this. And then, because he knows where the, the conversation is going, he tells them the parable of the tenants in the vineyard, which is clearly, have a look at it, you'll find it in chapter 12. It's quite clearly about their reaction to him. And for the first time, it's clear that they're going to kill Jesus. And then, still with the tension rising, the Pharisees and the Herodians, we saw them back in chapter 3 planning to kill him. Now it's quite clear what's on the table. And they come to him and say, tell me, is it permissible to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now that is a lethal question. You see, if he says, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, they can just telephone Pilate and say, right, we've got him. You can put this man to death. But if he says, oh yes, by all means pay tax to Caesar, it's the right thing to do, then he's lost it. He's got no street credibility at all. And uh, no one will be at all interested in hearing what he has to say. And so it goes on. The next group to come are the Sadducees. They're the conservatives. They're involved in the temple. They run the temple and they disappear after the destruction of of the temple in 70 AD. Now we know these people didn't believe in the resurrection. So they ask a silly question about the resurrection. A woman has seven husbands, according to Mosaic law. In the so-called resurrection, they say, which of them is going to be her husband? And Jesus effortlessly goes through them and says, you've never read the book of Exodus, have you? And he's wise there because Exodus is part of the limited range of texts that they accepted. And in the book of Exodus, at the chapter of the burning bush, it says, Abraham, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. He's the God of the living, not of the God of dead. And then he just ends, you are very much mistaken. Then the next story that happens, I'm going to read that with you because it's such a surprising one. You've got a scribe coming after all these, these tense moments. And there comes to him one of the scribes, and we know that means trouble, and he heard them arguing, and he saw that Jesus answered well, and he interrogated him, which is the number one commandment of all? And that was a dangerous question, because there's 613 commandments in the entire Bible. You might count them tonight. And Jesus replied, this is number one. Hear, O Israel, and he's quoting the prayer that every good Jew makes twice a day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your understanding and with all your strength. And then he gives them another one, two for the price of one. This is the second commandment. You're to love your neighbour as yourself. Greater than these, there is no other commandment. And we wait to see what this scribe is going to say. And he's bowled over. He says, wow, you have spoken well, teacher, that he is one and there is no other than God. And loving God with all your heart and all your understanding and all your strength and loving your neighbour as yourself is bigger than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And then we get Jesus' response. And Jesus, seeing that he was answering intelligently, said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared ask him any more questions. Underneath that apparently charming meeting of minds, there's the awareness that death is coming and it's going to come to Jesus from the very people who should have welcomed him, the religious authorities. And there's just one other thing that Mark does I'm going to read with you. Mark does a thing called sandwiching. So he wraps one story round another. And what he does right at the beginning of the Passion story, you'll find this in chapter 14. 14 and 15 are the very long account that Mark gives of the Passion. And as chapter 14 has begun, we hear the chief priests plotting with the scribes how they're going to kill Jesus. And then Mark inserts this story just before Judas comes along and offers to betray Jesus. And this is how the story goes. While Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, when he was lying down, that's to eat, there came a woman with an alabaster jar of nard, genuine stuff, very expensive. And she broke the alabaster and she poured it 
over his head. So she's anointing him as Messiah. And there were some who were very angry inside themselves. Why did this waste of myrrh happen? This myrrh could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they snorted at her. And Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you give her such hassle? She's done a good work for me. You always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do them good, but you don't always have me. Amen, I'm telling you. Whenever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be spoken of in memory of her. And then he makes a comment on what she's done. She has done what she had it in her to do. She took myrrh in advance to anoint my body for its burial. So do you see what's happened there? She has anointed him saying he's the Messiah and he has reinterpreted it. This is a Messiah who's going to die. The passion really hangs over this story of Mark's Gospel.